one of the things that I understand was was uh, a kind of um, overall uh, approach that you took as a as a leader was not to be a leader through a lot of this. I mean that you sort of your your philosophy was bottom up rather than top down the traditional hierarchical structure of leadership. So um I mean I was looking at what Ella was talking about on the one hand which was the idea of uh, the model that we saw was what she did for SNCC, which was, or what she did for the sit-in movement, right? So you have this real grassroots movement, and what she's doing is allowing for the people in the movement to form an organizational space where they can grow themselves, right? and come to command the direction and the strategies, right, and see their movement to a completion of some sort in terms of its original goals, right, that they themselves should be agents for this, right, so that they don't become part of some some other group's agency, right. So um, I become part of that, right, which is SNCC. I mean, and Ella sets this up, right? In Mississippi, the SNCC people, the target is the adult population, and in the Delta, it's those three categories, the day laborers, domestic workers, the sharecroppers, right, primarily. Um, what we managed to do is set up for a brief time the Freedom Democratic Party, which is doing in some sense for them around the vote and political action what um, Ella helped do for the sit-in movement around the public accommodations and access to public accommodations. So setting up a group um, where they have agency. So you get someone like Fannie Lou Hamer who really emerges in her own right as a national spokesperson, right? And has, she is able to actually grow herself, right? From this being a sharecropper to becoming a force in the country, right? So the philosophy for doing that is, um, I think, this philosophy that Ella kind of uh, exhibited. She actually uh, modeled it in, in you know, what she did with SNCC. Now, from, I think, my ability to actually listen and learn, right, um, and absorb, right, so and instinctively I took that, right, into Mississippi with me, right, when I came down to Mississippi, and um, that's what was put in place. Now, um, from AMSI and them, we got strategy about surviving and moving, right, and actually, you know, how to operationalize this strategy, right? But I think the overall strategy, um, I don't know any other place um, where I would have come across it. You see it in Dewey's writings um, um, when he talks about that people who want to work for the common good often do things which end up being neither good nor common, and he says they're not good because they're done at the expense of the active growth of the people who you're trying to work with, and not common because these people have no share, really, in the strategy and and you know the actual planning of it. So, and I'm not sure where Ella picked it up from, um, and but certainly somewhere along 
she picked it up and it became part of how she lived uh, to such an extent that it could be transmitted down to a next generation. That is, if you see something being enacted out and you know how it looks and feels, right, um, not just how it sounds on paper, right, but how it looks in real life and you see it operating, then you have a, a chance of, of actually tuning into it, right? And so that's, that's how I think about what happened, right? And that summer, uh, as I understand it, I mean, there was this, this progression from uh, what Mississippi was, was uh, considered to be, if not the most violent, certainly one of the most violent uh, um, uh, states, and the, and the area that you were functioning in, uh, it, was Macomb called the bombing capital, or after '64, you know, they they actually had a whole spree of bombings. There, right, yeah. and I uh, see. Bryant's church was, was bombed, bombed and yeah. I think it's, it's something like 30 bombings and uh, killings, and I mean, just an extraordinary, um, um, violent uh, uh, period. And it seemed that 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 summer of '64, when you were bringing in the, the the different workers, and you were really the the, the voter registration uh, effort seemed to be spreading. That you you saw the common man more and more of the people actually beginning to believe. In other words, you'd earned right. you'd earned what was necessary for everyone around you to say, okay, we'll step to the plate with you. And, and also, but, uh, you know, the group that worked in Mississippi from 61 up through 63, leading into 64, um, that SNCC group and uh, a little cadre of core field secretaries, uh, we all also had to earn the right to call the country in, right? In other words, um, there wasn't any way, once the call went out and the, the students responded to the call, and they responded to the call because of what we had done, right, how we had lived, right, but there also wasn't any way for the country um, to actually um, strike it out and, um, you know, to come after us in a way that could stop it, right? And so part of that is, is what you earn, because if there was a way in which it could have been stopped, it would have been stopped. Right. And the Mississippi Freedom Democrat Democratic Party, that whole effort, um, it had to have been, in the end, very frustrating for you, mm -hmm. uh, because y you did everything you followed all the all the rules. I mean, you 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 did what was necessary in terms of making a formal challenge and and legal challenge to the Mississippi delegation at at the Democratic convention. And everything logically seemed to be on your side, and it seemed that the political structure basically sandbagged you. Humphrey did not come through for you? Tried to stop the whole thing? Um, so I think what was frustrating, frustrating was also the revelation about the bankruptcy of the national political structures. I think that's... Um, and in some sense, our unpreparedness, right, for that revelation, that it was a, a lack of uh, the depth of our own understanding about these structures and what could be expected of them, right? Uh, and so the expectation that they could actually, uh, in a sense, revolutionize themselves, because you're really talking about 
going all the way back to Reconstruction and what happened in the country with the Democratic Party after the Civil War and what happened in Mississippi um, with terrorizing the black people out of political you know, uh, engagement. Um, that, and we, had, we didn't have, on our part, we didn't have a deep enough understanding of that history to know that in, in some sense that's what we were dealing with and that the country wasn't ready to deal with it. Right? Um, and in a sense still isn't. I mean, I, I think that's what we're looking at on the education issue, right? Um, because one, one of the results of this political process was that instead of having a politics which was going to educate the populace, right? you had a politics which was going to do just the opposite, right? It was going to subjugate them, right? And so I think these issues go very deep into, you know, the country and its history. And so we didn't have a sense of that, right, of uh, the, the extent of the bankruptcy of the national politics. It, it certainly unveiled itself in Atlantic City. I mean, it's like the curtain was parted and there it was, you could see, right, that there was, there was no force here, right, to actually push this forward. But also we didn't, I think, have a deep enough understanding of what the forces were that we were coming up against, right? Even after all that you had been through? Well, because we didn't have the, we didn't understand the history of how how this... <laughs> yeah, okay, gotcha. All right, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what we didn't really... I mean, and I'm, you know, on the second go-round, I'm really searching for a deeper understanding in terms of the history um, to understand what the forces are um, that we are working with and against um, Around this education issue, uh, to but it's it's you know it's the flip side of the voting issue uh, because the reason for denying uh, blacks in the first place after the Civil War the participation in the politics is because you wanted to make sure that they stayed in their proper place and. Um, as Conant has said, um, I don't know if you know that little book, uh, Slums and Suburbs, but Conant was president of Harvard from 33 to 53, and you know he set up the SAT and ETS. But in this little book, he, he's looking at what he calls slum schools and suburban schools in the late 50s. And what he's saying is that the nation, since the Civil War, set up a caste system Right, for its Negro citizens. Um, North and South had to agree to do this, but what he didn't realize um, until just belatedly was that the main driver of the country's caste system was its educational system, that we run an educational system in the country to drive a caste system. Right? And so the understanding of that as the result of what you know, the overthrow of Reconstruction and, you know, that whole century down to when we get there, um, looking at the right to vote, we didn't have that, you know. 